Hi, thanks for tuning in. In this video, we are going to show how to launch the VMAX 4000 software and provide a general overview. To start, I'm going to click on the VMAX 4000 shortcut that can be seen on my desktop here. This will be set up when you do your initial VMAX 4000 software installation. Now you'll notice that I'm getting a message telling me that the firmware on one or more of my modules that are installed on this VMAX rack is out of date compared to the software that I have installed. So I have the option to ignore this or to update. And it's always best to update to make sure that your firmware matches the software that you're using. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit update. And this will take a couple of minutes and it will depend on how many modules you actually have installed in the rack. Now it is important here to make sure that you do not power the rack off as you can see this message is being displayed. Okay, so now that the firmware has been updated, we are now inside of the software. And a couple things to note as we land here. So this is sort of your, this is your home screen. You'll notice right now I do have a warning message that displayed um, that is displayed because I do not have a valid test selected. Um, that would kind of be the first thing that we have to do um, if we we're you know, going to start setting our equipment up. So a couple of things that I like to do on a new software install would be to uh, go and visit the icons that you see in the upper right hand corner. And there's a few different things that are that are kind of of interest. Um, the first one that I like to go to is the user preferences screen, and that is this icon right here. When you go in the user preferences, it gives you a place to, to set up like your default analog channel excitation voltage. Um, so, for example, most of the sensors that I presently use are all 10 volt. Um, if I had a mixture of, you know, something that with lower voltages, I could program that in to make sure that those sensors are never have too much excitation voltage when the uh, rack first powers itself up. Uh, there's places where we can check if we want um, channel saturation warnings, same thing for NVH channels. And then there's a bunch of different options that you can see here. Um, always log map channels, um, show the sound and alarms tab, show the user channels tab, show map channel summary tab. Um, you can select your what your map channel units would be um, thermal couple colors here. There's a lot of different things that, um, you know, that can be done. Uh, one of those also would be the screen theme. So depending upon your preferences and maybe you're operating in a light or, um, a dark environment may dictate how you set the screens up here, but we do have light and dark screen selection. I prefer the light one myself. And then kind of an important one is to choose your data log or base path. So typically we like to use the, um, the C drive. Uh, C colon backslash data. Now this can be set to something else. Um, you do not want to set this to something like a memory stick. You want it to be a you know a large capacity hard drive, for example, would be the most preferential. Once you have these things set up, go ahead and click the accept button. Something else that's worth pointing out would be that um, there's also the help help topics here. So if you go through um, there's a number of different, you know, written instruction, as well as there are a couple of videos. Um, these are more so set up for video cameras and things like that. You can also launch the VMAX user manual. So if you click this guy here, this will launch uh, what currently is a 86 page user manual that walks through a lot of what we will talk about in these tutorial videos. Um, in addition to that, there is panel connectors, and when you click on this, that's going to launch a window that will show you for each of the common module types what the pinout of those connectors are. So if you find yourself in a situation to where uh, maybe you need to add some sensors that Link is not providing for you directly, um, you can wire these yourself. So the uh, 4010 analog input module, you can see is an 8-pin, it's a LIMO connector. And it gives you the pinout of plus minus excitation, plus minus signal, um, pins five and six reserved for um, calibration. Um, so those pins can be shunted or um, 
those pins can be shorted together for shunt resistance type calculations. So now that we have those items out of the way, we'll go through a real general, um, generally speaking, how the software works. Uh, so to, to get to a place where we can understand um, what hardware modules have been installed and where we do our, our setup and everything, we're gonna go to the system setup screen here. Um, something else to point out before I go there would be that I do have a warning up here that I have VMAX modules that are overdue for calibration. And we will see that when we go into these next screens. So inside of the system setup panel, uh, you'll notice that there's a large amount of tabs that go across the top. And then in each one of those tabs, we actually have some information that we can um, select or we can modify for our uh, particular test of it. So as we start off here and to get rid of this um, test not valid error message that we're seeing, I'm going to go ahead and click the select or create test. And when I do that, it's going to launch this window and I'll, I will have access to any tests that have been created before, so I could select that test, um, or I can create a new one. So let's go ahead and create a new test, and I'm going to call it uh, Demo Test 1. I'm going to hit the Enter button. And then when I do that, it's going to ask me if I would like to uh, keep my channel configuration from where I'm at right now, or if I would like to uh, start from scratch. So I'm going to go ahead and keep... Okay, now on this screen, we have some of our basic logger settings. We have uh, three different sample rates that we can select. We have our fast rate, which is what you would collect most of your signals um, at, typically. Um, and this number, by default, our, our, our as ship software is limited to 1,000 hertz. We also have a slow rate, which would typically be used for sensors that do not update very quickly, so something like a thermocouple. So, for example, if you're collecting analog data, maybe at 1,000 hertz, thermocouple data, in order to save some space and um, in order to save some space on the hard drive, we could collect that at a slower sample rate. Um, so this could be really any number, um, but if we wanted to, it could be 500 hertz or it could be 10 hertz. And those would both be based upon event-based logging. Now, we also have something called global slow rate. Now, global slow is more like a continuous recording of signals, and that can be done whether we are actually collecting event-based data or not. So, for example, anytime the logger is turned on and enabled, it could be logging global slow data on any channels that we wanted to. So we could see things that happened in between the events that we actually recorded. Okay, so moving on, I'm going to go to the Rack tab, and that's going to take me to the screen that we see here, and there's a few things of interest. Um, one, it's going to lay out all of the modules that are installed on this particular piece of data acquisition. So it's going to give me a serial number, um, a description of it, how many channels are there, and it's also going to tell me uh, when it was last calibrated, and we'll also see some information about firmware. As you'll notice here, I have a whole bunch of shaded red cells indicating that my modules are outside of calibration. Now there is a way to suppress this message that we see on the main screen here, um, but it is a way to help remind our users as they're using their equipment um, and how and when that they should have their calibrations performed. Um, and again, each company's calibration interval um, you know, could, be, could be different based upon your existing quality policy. We can also see here the IP address of the power module. And the way that our, our software is able to interact with the hardware rack is through Ethernet. So on a laptop or on a 4055 CPU module, you connect to the power module through the local area connection. Um, and currently, the way that we ship our power modules is they're all configured with this 172.16 address. So the so if we were to take a look at the Ethernet or the local area connection properties, and we go to Internet Protocol version four here, 
um, we'll see that the IP address that we have for the computer that is connecting to that power module is very similar. So the actual IP address of the machine is 172.16.0.10. You'll notice that we have a very similar IP range um, that needs to be configured on the computer in order to connect to that power module. So one of the nice things about the VMAX software is that it is able to automatically detect any input module that's been added or removed since the last time we used the system. So for example, the six modules that we see that are installed here, if I was to power this machine off and add another six, um, the next time I boot the software up, I would actually see 12 modules populate. And then depending upon the type of input modules that I have um, installed, more of these tabs across the top would either uh, disappear or appear depending upon um, the actual hardware that's been installed. So to move on, I'm going to show, um, we're not going to go through any calibration or anything like that now. We'll handle that in later videos. But the different screens that we see here are how we would set up our physical channels that we would plug into the system. So the first module that I have to the right of my power module is an analog input module. Um, and you can see that I have up to eight channels available. If I had more than one analog module installed, I would actually see channels one through 16, for example. I have a pulse uh, speed input module installed, which we use for GPS sensors or wheel encoders and things like that. Um, you'll see that I have five inputs that are available through the pulse channels here. Uh, thermocouples, I've got a thermocouple input module, which can accept uh, K, J, or T-type thermocouples, and you can change this on a channel-by-channel -channel basis, up to 15 of those per module. We also have a CAN input screen, and the 4080 power module uh, does have a 3-pin LIMO connector labeled CAN, and we are able to uh, take CAN signals in, and there's also an add-in where we can transmit CAN signals out for displaying on an auxiliary display device. Um, in order to use this, we would need a CAN cable, so something to be able to interface with the LIMO connector, and then whatever the CAN device is. Um, on a passenger vehicle, it could be the OBD2 connector. So we have a cable that will plug directly into the diagnostic port underneath the dash of the vehicle, and then interface with the three pin LIMO connector on the 4080 power module. I also have some digital channels. These are part of the pulse input module, but we have the ability to take in digital signals as well as um, output some digital signals as well. So we've got digital in and out available to us. So as we go through, you'll notice that um, you know, each tab, generally speaking, represents a specific module. There's the NVH module. This is probably one of the more complex ones based upon the number of settings that are available to you. So here we get to our event triggers. So this would be how we command the VMAX to arm itself, to start logging and to stop logging. And any channel that we have access to, whether it's a math channel or a physical channel um, or an added in software channel through a software customization, um, any of those can be used uh, for triggering. We also have a sounds and alarm tab. So we have ways to display items to the driver to help them or operator of the equipment if they need to do something based upon a time interval, based upon a distance interval. Um, there's sounds that can be played if certain things happen as channel alarms, things like that. We also have a map channel summary. So in the link software, we give the user the ability to set up a list of mapped channels that take on a channel number. And these can be used no matter where you physically plug a sensor in on the data acquisition. Um, this, this makes post data analysis much easier. So you can have a test report template that is always looking for left front torque on map channel 101, regardless of if it was physically plugged into physical channel 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, or 8. 
you can take all of that sort of out of the equation um, and make standardizing your reporting practices much, much easier. And then last but not least here, we have user channels. And user channels are channels that are set up in software by add-ins. And in just a moment, I'll show one of our software add-ins. Um, in this particular case, I have a, a GPS sensor add-in that is, um, you'll see, has a number of, of different channels here. Now, these channels um, can be logged just like all of our other channels. Um, you know, we have summary data information about them, be able to look at raw data, all of those type of things. So, as we're talking about all of these different settings that we have and we can set up our configurations, you'll notice in each one of these places we have where we can um, load and save setup files. And that can be very helpful for, you know, if you have certain tests that you may run and configure them a certain way, it gives you the ability to um, be able to go back to, you know, predefined standards that you may have set up. So I'm going to go ahead and close this window out now. We're going back to our home screen. And on our home screen here, there's also this button called add-ins. And what an add-in is, is a piece of software, a script that has been written that can enhance features or provide this a different software experience without actually having to modify the original software. So it can be like a customization. It can be a way to add in a sensor that may interface through um, RS-232 or through a CPU module directly in this case. Our 4055 CPU module that we sell as part of our VMAX systems has a GPS sensor that is installed inside of it. And if we look at these add-ins here, we can see that we have two that have been installed. So I have a CAN transmit out so I can send CAN signals out. And then I also have a sensor for this GPS sensor that's been set up. You can see that I've got a wide range of other add-ins that could be installed. And there's a lot, there's lots of different um, add-ins that are available here, depending upon what, um, what you're doing with your testing. But on this UBlox GPS, for example, if I double click on the add-in, it will launch a screen that allows me to do some setup. So you can see I have this GPS system is turned on, but I'm not currently using it for anything in this test. If I were to select these guys, it would turn that sensor on. Now I don't have that sensor physically installed, so I am going to get error messages, but this would provide a way for me to start recording GPS data just as if I had physically plugged in a typical transducer and configured it. So it's important to remember that there are physical channels that you may install, and then there are also um, user type channels that are handled through software add-ins. Now it's also important to note that when you install an add-in, um, the software must be rebooted. So anytime we need to add or remove user channels, it does require a reboot of the system. Um, so for example, if I was interested to install one of these other add-ins, I can click the install button, and then it's gonna give me this option to apply action and restart. And when I do that, it is actually going to shut the software down and then reboot it back up with that add-in installed. Okay, so now that the software is rebooted, I actually have an error message. So I installed an add-in that requires a telemetry module to be installed, and there is no telemetry module, so you can see that I have this error message. But what it did do was actually um, install that piece of software for me, um, so that when I do have the module installed, it will be functional. Now to remove that, I can click the remove button and then apply and restart and it'll go through that same process. It'll shut the software down, boot the software back up with that custom script being removed. So it's always important that as you are using add-ins, you want to only use, only have add-ins installed when you need them um, because you will create user channels and depending upon the add-ins that you have installed, it can actually slow down PC performance. If you have some very exhaustive add-ins installed, that might be doing lots of calculations and things like that. Um, so it certainly makes sense to use them. 
um, when when required, but you don't want to leave a bunch of add-ins installed as you go to a new test and maybe don't have a need for it anymore. Okay, so now that we have we've walked through physical channels and, and add-ins, we've got a, a general idea on how that works. Um, some of the other places that we would typically go in the software would be to the run screens. Now, the run screens can be configured any way that a user likes, um, but you can see that we have sort of five buttons here, and you can certainly expand on that. But this gives you a way to have predefined layouts that can be customized completely to your liking. So in the first example, screen one, I just had some basic tables with some real-time channel information. Screen two here is set up as an NVH screen where I have microphones and accelerometers for each corner of a passenger vehicle. The third screen is just a subjective driver rating screen where they could subjectively rate noise events or something else that may have happened while they were capturing an event. Um, screen four is set up as uh, having target bars so we can have a, a real real time display here of any channel that we want um, in this graph. Same, same thing over here. And then we can actually have some targets. So I could have a targeted pedal travel, um, a targeted speed, and we can actually have ramp times associated with that to aid the operator in making very smooth applications of whatever it is that they're trying to execute. So hopefully this intro um, helps give you a little bit more familiarity with our software and how it works. We will have additional videos that illustrate how to perform calibrations and actually um, start stop logging and be able to configure those things. Um, in order to close our software, you can simply just click the X button here. Um, the best practice, if you are using an embedded CPU, so a 4055 CPU module, would be to use the shutdown software button here. And when we do that, there's a couple of options. Shutdown will just shut the software down. It will leave the 4055 CPU module, which is a Windows-based uh, PC. It will leave it on. Um, the, the best way to handle powering down one of those units really is to use this power off feature. Now I'm using my laptop right now and I don't want it to power my laptop down. So I'm not gonna click this button. But if I were, it's going to ask me one more time if I really want to do this or if I want to cancel. But it will essentially shut down the, the, the CPU that is running the VMAX rack. And then some period of time after that, it will shut down the hardware as well. And this is how I always recommend that anyone who's using one of our embedded PC solutions for their VMAX to shut down the software.